Yes, hello. This is Dr. Martin. Uh, I'm pleased to be able to present this week's uh, uh, video and PowerPoint to accompany it. Um, I'll try the best that I can to set up the PowerPoint to follow along with the lecture. Um, this week, uh, there's three readings, um, and in order that I'll be covering them, uh, and the ideas that sort of tie them together um, will be uh, first uh, Richard Rorty's article, uh, second I will cover um, uh, Mill's article on uh, Michael Foucault, and lastly I'll hit uh, the article by Lewis on critical realism. Um, uh, one way I, I sort of retitled this week, uh, as you can see on the on the front slide, uh, "Voices from Continental Philosophy: Hermeneutics, Critical Realism, and the Postmodern Critique of Scientism." Um, so this video really kind of will explain the fundamental ideas um, behind. Um, really uh, content of philosophy a little bit. Uh, uh, also, I'll look especially at hermeneutics, how hermeneutics especially informs uh, both of uh, uh, postmodernism and social constructivism, um, and critical realism for that matter. Um, and then we'll look at specifically these ideas. Um, and we'll, in the back of our, our mind, we'll, uh, we'll make some references to science. All of these are uh, somewhat quite critical of science. So uh, so first, uh, this distinction between analytic and continental philosophy. I find this, I, I, as I was thinking about these articles in contrast to the ones that we've had before, although there's been some overlapping, um, I find that this is a nice way to di distinguish between the articles that we have this week, which really come from continental philosophy, ideas that originated really from Europe uh, post Kant um, that that take uh, philosophy in a certain direction, um, um, whereas the ideas that originated more in England and then carried into North America uh, and and really dominate uh, a majority of philosophical thought in North America. Although there's some continental philosophy schools, some of which I've attended. Um, my real background is a lot more in continental philosophy than analytic philosophy. Um, a couple uh, in the first slide, just quickly. Uh, well, what are the distinctions? Um, you can see in the first slide that analytic philosophy uh, main sources of authority are logic, mathematics, and science. That seems to be what it sees it's in continuous with, uh, in service to, and sometimes subordinate to the natural sciences. Uh, it treats philosophy as discrete problems outside of the historical, social, economic, pol political context out of which it, it emerges. On the other hand, continental philosophy rejects natural sciences as actually the most accurate way of understanding phenomena. It's quite critical of uh, sometimes the hegemonic uh, narrative. This is the language that frequently is used in continental philosophy uh, that science is. Um, they believe that science, uh, this is following Kant, is actually dependent upon sort of these pre-theoretical substrates of experience or these constructs that we actually have, um, and we're going to talk a little bit about that, how that uh, is understood in hermeneutics. Uh, it tends towards historicism, meaning it grapples with how space and time, uh, the language, linguistics, uh, and culture uh, and history out of which knowledge has arisen uh, uh, actually shapes knowledge itself in politics, I might add, especially with Foucault. Um, uh, the next slide I'm moving to, um, just a, a few things to end with. Um, uh, continental philosophy holds that uh, uh, human agency can, in fact, uh, change the conditions uh, of experience. Uh, and some of those from a post-Marxian and critical theory standpoint would especially uh, emphasize that there's a real responsibility that knowledge has to transform uh, the societies that that are there. We will get to that a little bit more when we get to Foucault and uh, critical realism. One distinction I think that's really helpful at the heart of this, that if you've had some philosophy, you know this. I referred to this earlier, I think, in week two in an article. My article begins with a quote from Kant. Um, but Kant made this distinction between uh, the things, when we examine things, for instance, this stapler, uh, and then the perception that I have of the stapler itself. And the distinction, I think, as you can see in that slide, is 
what I perceive of this object, the stapler, is called the phenomena, the thing in my head. And then uh, the physical object itself is called the noumenon. So why do I begin with Kant? Well, at the heart of the continental debate is that Kant actually made the argument that we can never really come to know the noumenon, the physical object itself, outside of how we perceive it. But the question, of course, is how, uh, how does culture and language um, and social structures shape how we perceive the world? Does language, in fact, help shape our understanding of the world itself? Uh, when you move from one uh, context to another, um, you can easily... There are different words, and translation between contexts is very difficult. It's not easy because words give and shape meaning. That is the position of uh, continental philosophy. Analytic philosophy focuses a lot more on analyzing the noumenon. Okay? That's another way, I think, to understand it. Of course, some of these bigger questions that we immerse is what shapes how we perceive the world, culture, language, social structures, um, and that's a lot of what um, this week looks at. So again, the ideas inherent in Rory or hermeneutics he does uh, uh, make a comparison between Gadamer's hermeneutics and Dewey's pragmatism. Um, I don't want to dwell too much on pragmatism. That's a whole other lecture itself. Uh, Mills, then, uh, we look at uh, so ideas that often would be associated with postmodernism or poststructuralism. And then Lewis, uh, who gets into critical realism and a bit of a critique from Harai on it, even though Harai was uh, actually, uh, I believe, Boxar's uh, dissertation director. Let's move forward to uh, Rorty. Um, on this, the next slide, uh, I, I basically have the order of what he does. You can use that as a guide if need be, uh, but that kind of walks you through what exactly he's trying to do in his argument. Um, he's trying to link Dewey's American pragmatism with the French-German hermeneutic tradition um, and ties how these traditions are similar. He touches on various Deweyan notions and the controversies they sparked. Uh, he mentions this whole concept of vulgar relativism. We'll talk about that momentarily. He links Dewey's pragmatism with Gadamer's hermeneutic. He argues that both thinkers replace Plato's emphasis on reason, oftentimes a truth as correlation. Uh, what one says correlates to the reality of the thing uh, with tradition, community, and human solidarity. He believes that that uh, is where truth really arises from. Um, okay, so let's talk quickly about the platonic emphasis on reason and truth. For those that have read a bit of Plato, Plato's uh, emphasis, is, especially in the Republic, you can see this in his famous allegory of the cave, is to remove... Um, he, he really moves... Uh, well, his idea is that reason, right, we can reason is able to ascertain uh, truth. For him, of course, he moves away from the material world, but he does talk about the abstractness and certitude that reason can bring. That's sort of expanded even more in the Enlightenment. Now, uh, Rorty is, is talking about Nietzsche, who criticizes this. Nietzsche is in the late 19, uh, 1900s, late, uh, I'm sorry, 1800s, so late 19th century is when he's writing. Um, and, and then he begins to talk about Gadamer. Gadamer is sort of a student of, of, uh, of Heidegger, Martin Heidegger, um, who is really in some ways the father, him and Edmund Husserl, his own, Husserl, his own teacher, of uh, hermeneutics. Um, so what is hermeneutics? Well, again, if we go back to that distinction between the noumena and the phenomenon, uh, hermeneutics flows out of phenomenology, is connected to phenomenology, and that is the belief that what we have in our head, right, of things and the world around it, right, um, is uh, is what cons really uh, what uh, what is the basis of knowledge for us. So if I have this in my head and you have it in your head, depending upon your own sort of social, cultural, um, maybe even gender and uh, class and race, um, all of those things will influence. Um, what one understands to be real, okay? So in some ways, this really helps justify and claim subjective truth. Um, 
And not only that, it, it, it suggests that hermeneutics begins to talk about things as, as textual. Okay, everything is sort of textual. Uh, and um, that all truth in some way is textual. So there is the beginning and end, and within that text, whether that be culture, and, uh, uh, and there's a narrative within that, um, so a lot of times narratives, these are called narratives. There's a meaning system and rules within that meaning system um, that can be called a certain type of truth. Well, uh, the criticism of science, okay, uh, is that, that, that science itself is a limited and bounded narrative, essentially. Uh, it is, is one textual way of understanding uh, and making claim to reality itself. But it does to only claim that that is the only way of understanding and seeing uh, reality um, is to uh, um, really almost imperialize uh, other or colonize uh, other realms of truth. So hermeneutics suggests that there are many traditions, each of with its narratives, and that those narratives have truth claims at the heart of it. And so the goal of hermeneutics is to uh, engage in uh, sort of productive discussions or discourses between narratives. Um, and so that's kind of what hermeneutics is. Now let's move forward in this. So what is Rorty doing by it? Well, he's bring, trying to bring Godmer in and link him with, with, um, with Dewey, suggesting that in some ways Dewey uh, was not, uh, if, if you read Dewey's writing, uh, you could see uh, John Dewey that in being a pragmatist, it, at some point he almost verges on being a social constructivist in some of his writing. I, I think of even early in Child in the Curriculum, you can read uh, at points there. Um, so he's trying to link him with, with Dewey, probably to support his position. But that article in particular is about sort of multiculturalism. So obviously, a hermeneutic position uh, philosophically would support multiculturalism, because it, it suggests that there are many different narratives, many different claims to truth, and that if we're teaching only one culture or one type of truth, we're leaving something out. Um, we're doing a disservice not only to our students, but especially uh, a real disservice to those uh, groups that don't have their narratives represented, so minorities in particular. Of uh, whether that be uh, class or culture or ethnicity or gender or sexuality for that matter. Um, so um, Nietzsche's essentially suggesting by going after Plato an absolute truth, that truth is always somewhat subjective. It is always, always tradition bound. Um, and, and then Rorty is going to suggest in the middle of his argument, based on uh, Godmer, that that truth is really based on language. So because of that, it is not universal, and therefore should be talked about as textual, contextual, and tradition-bound. Um, that's in contrast to Plato and Locke. Okay, so I have a slide on that. He maintains, of course, that he's sort of critical of, of extreme uh, forms of uh, relativism, because um, one could criticize this and say, well, what if, there, if you don't believe that, that all truth is somewhat relative or bounded by these traditions, how do you maintain uh, uh, certain laws or certain ethics? Um, it's, it becomes a lot more difficult. How do you maintain their sort of universal truths that everybody ought to learn or, or go by? And so he wants to suggest that, that there is truth within, uh, within his system, hermeneutics. Hermeneutics, there is truth within it. Um, it's just that it, that truth is boundary, bound, there's boundaries to it um, by the tradi traditions that inform it. So there's rules within each of these traditions that ought to be respected. Um, and that by having those rules, um, people ought to walk uh, and be taught about the traditions. Not just one tradition, but the many traditions. Um, and the heroes, he talks about that within those traditions to inspire people to learn each within those traditions. So you can understand traditions as disciplines of study, um, maybe methods or approaches, 